Ah, the lowly mockbuster. Just in case you're unfamiliar with the term, mockbusters are ultra-low-budget productions crafted forth by studios of questionable integrity, which take advantage of name recognition and consumers with poor attention to detail to sell thousands upon thousands of rentals of rip-offs of currently popular franchises. The most successful of these studios, The Asylum, has been in business for almost two decades and are responsible for such beloved favorites as The Da Vinci Treasure. I told you I'd be here for the payoff. Atlantic Rim. And everyone's favorite, Snakes on a Train. Yes, the Asylum will be making an appearance or two here. Despite relying solely on bargain basement production values, crappy CGI, theft, and deception, these studios remain in existence because, well, what they do works. Asylum has never produced a film that failed to make back twice its budget. And with over a dozen movies a year, they just have no reason to stop. On the positive side, these ripoffs do employ hundreds of writers, cast, and crew, all of whom need work to do. And since even a broken clock is right twice a day, some of these films have been surprisingly entertaining. Despite the notoriously tight control of character rights in the superhero world, even some of these films have become victims to the mockbuster. So today, we're going over 7 insanely shitty superhero ripoffs. Avengers Grimm One popular method of circumventing character rights is to write a script featuring a bunch of characters whose rights are in the public domain, free for all to use, and then slap a familiar sounding title as a result. It's a good thing for the asylum that Disney was either unable to or didn't think to copyright the word Avengers. As implied by the title, our heroes are edgily updated versions of beloved storybook characters. Pursued by such badasses as Sleeping Beauty, Rapunzel, and Snow White, the villainous Rumblestiltskin attempts to use a brainwashed Red Riding Hood to help him open an interdimensional portal and get back to fairy tale world. One extremely conspicuous nod to Marvel is in the character of Iron John, a Hulk looking thing with a Stark like name who probably likes to smash things a lot. As a final insult, this character is played by veteran actor Louis Ferrigno, who of course played the Hulk in the old TV series and voiced the Green Goliath in the second entry in the MCU, 2008's The Incredible Hulk. Sinister Squad now, try to get your head around this. Sinister Squad is a sequel to Avengers Grimm. That's right, this film represents the first time ever that a mockbuster studio ripped off a property to serve as a sequel to a film for which they ripped off of a rival studio. Of course, this could only work by once again paying the barest lip service to DC supervillain team up, with a quote unquote good guys use bad guys to fight even worse bad guys plot being the only common thread. These bad guys include the Big Bad Wolf, the Queen of Hearts, and of course, Rumpelstiltskin. Although unfortunately not being played by the same actor, he was recasted with some guy who apparently gives off more of a Jared Leto jokery kind of vibe. The plot involves bringing all these bad guys together to stop some kind of doomsday cult from bringing about the end of the world. Why they couldn't ask the good guys instead is unclear. Given the public domain nature of the properties involved, it seems unlikely that this will be the last time we see the Asylum storybook superhero universe. Rise of the Black Bat A relative newcomer to directed video Drek, Tomcat Studios has been churning out quickie horror films with titles like Lizzie Borden's Revenge and Mansion of Blood since about 2010. Any filmmaker will tell you that horror movies are the cheapest to produce and carry the biggest potential upside, but Tomcat has on occasion dipped their toes into the mockbuster pool with some awesomely hilarious results. With 2012's Rise of the Black Bat, the strategy seems to have been smashing together two beloved properties, in this case Batman and Daredevil, and retain just enough of each to keep the lawsuits from automatically falling themselves. It's the story of District Attorney Tony Quinn, who, through the miracle of science, is given bat-like night vision and being blinded by a crime boss. Tony takes on the mantle of the Black Bat, launching a crusade to disrupt the criminal activity in the city, and presumably hoping night after night that he doesn't get his ass kicked by the real Batman. The trailer sure is a thing of wonder. It's obvious the most expensive prop was the Batman mask with the ears chopped off, with production value somewhere on the scale between amateur porn and semi-professional porn. But it must have turned in a profit, not unreasonable, considering that it looks like it just costed a hundred bucks to make, for Tomcat would return to the superhero ripoff well just a year later. Captain Battle Legacy War Upon viewing the trailer for Captain Battle Legacy War, one thought springs immediately to mind. How the hell were they able to get away with this? 
it's the story of a soldier injured in battle who is given superpowers through an experimental treatment, and wears a costume that looks for all the world like one of the many variations worn by the Star Spangled Avenger. Adding to the confusion, he even wears an eye patch, like Nick Fury. Well, as it turns out, Captain Battle is an actual comic book character, first published by Silver Street Comics in May of 1941, only two months after Captain America's comic debut. The character only lasted about 13 issues, meaning Tomcat was probably able to secure the rights for this near-exact Cap clone for somewhere around 10 bucks. The story takes place in modern day, as the newly superpowered augmented captain returns to his hometown to find it overrun by, what else, Nazis, whose nefarious plan apparently involves kidnapping women and holding them captive in lingerie. This 2013 production was apparently Tomcat's final foray into the superhero mockbuster, but does this mean that the other members of Marvel's premier superhero team have gone untouched? Of course not. Almighty Thor and Thunderstorm Return of Thor Now obviously the characters of Norse mythology cannot be copyrighted. That means that anyone could theoretically make and release their own Thor movie. Heck, even I could, and if I did, I can practically guarantee a better film than Almighty Thor. Even by the already low standards of the Asylum, the film is an astonishing mess. The plot involves Loki stealing Mjolnir, here called the Hammer of Invincibility, in order to destroy a city on Earth for some reason. Thor must undergo warrior's training and ultimately face off in an epic battle against Loki in an abandoned LA parking lot to save the city and claim his hammer. Attempting an epic scale, the Asylum must have seriously needed to stretch this film's budget. The hammer of invincibility looks like it was made out of sheet metal, the CGI monsters are even crappier than usual, and the opening shot of Asgard, in stark contrast to the mind-bending opening of Marvel's film, looks like an abandoned model from a public television kids show. Even the smoldering good looks and swaggering star power of former 90s idol Richard Greco as Loki can't lend even a brief air legitimacy to this production. The film was released at almost the exact same time as Marvel's movie in 2011, and incredibly so was Tomcat's version, Thunderstorm The Return of Thor. In this version, Thor for some reason wears a mask that looks a lot like Iron Man. And judging by the trailer, the filmmakers at least thought to keep everything so dark that it's hard to notice how terrible the special effects are. Iron Hero, or Metal Man Metal Man was originally titled Iron Hero when it was released to video in 2008 to attempt to capitalize on the success of Marvel's Iron Man, though nobody had really any idea how huge that movie would be at the time. The incredibly low budget production sees a brilliant scientist and his mentor creating their powered suit of armor, only to see a powerful industrialist try to turn it into a weapon, which probably sounds a little familiar. As is to be expected, the acting is awful. The suit is definitely made out of painted plastic, and the sets appear to be anywhere the crew could get away with shooting without permits. But while this is all par of course, Metal Man gets special mention as being one of the most egregious mockbusters of all time for one unbelievable reason. You see, when Iron Man 2 was released in 2010, a tiny production company, Midnight Releasing, wanted to capitalize yet again. But instead of making a sequel, they simply repackaged Iron Hero, slapped a new title on it, and released it again. You may think that this would be the most complete lack of shame shown by any studio on this list, but you probably noticed that we have one entry left. The Amazing Bulk Yes, The Amazing Bulk. We'll give you a moment to stop laughing. Ready? Great. Now let's delve into the insane details of what has been called the Room of Superhero Movies. This Tomcat production makes their previous entries on this list look like an actual Marvel film by comparison, and that is putting it nicely. It's not so much a film as it is a masterclass in everything one should avoid when making a film. Aside from its liberal use of stock footage, public domain video, and actual webpage backgrounds, every shot involving actors was filmed against a green screen. How can we tell, you ask? Look at it, just look. Every single background appears to have been rendered on a Nintendo 64. The vehicles look like they have been warped from a third grader's MS Paint drawing into awful reality. The bulk himself is a shapeless CGI horror. Title screens are presented and the finest computer rendering 1993 had to offer. And speaking of titles, guess which font was used for them? Did you guess Comic Sans? You are correct. Unbelievably, director Louis Schoenbrunn professes to be a huge fan of the master filmmaker Stanley Kubrick, including several Kubrick references in this masterpiece, and has stated that he intended the film to occupy the same visual space as the groundbreaking 1988 feature Who Framed Roger Rabbit. We submit that Schoenbrunn may be the undiscovered Ed Wood of our generation. 
The Amazing Bulk was reportedly made on a budget of $14,000. After viewing this cataclysmically inept monstrosity, our only question is, where the hell did all the money go?